Welcome to the Sacred Dance Summit. I'm Leslie Zare, the author of The Alchemy of Dance, Sacred Dance as a Path to the Universal Dancer, and your host for this summit. My guest today is Elizabeth Glenn Copeland. Elizabeth is an author, artist facilitator, and theater artist whose earliest memories involve dancing under the sky with material taped to her arms to mimic wings. Though no longer able to launch herself headlong into the air, dance and mindful movement remain essential to her spiritual practice. Elizabeth has shared her gifts throughout North America and the UK, touring with Second City, doing improv comedy, playing the witch in Hansel and Gretel with the Honolulu Symphony, and facilitating at the San Miguel Writers' Conference as examples. Her written work has appeared in The Furious Gazelle, Forge Journal, and What Rough Beast. The Raven of Aaron Moore, co-written with husband Beverly Glenn Copeland, was produced at the 2015 Irish Festival. She won the 2014 WFNB Young Adult Fiction Award for Treya Newell, Miranda's Journey from the Great Forest. Her novel Jazz, Nature's Improvisation, was shortlisted for the 2015 Relit Award. In 2018, Elizabeth facilitated the Earth Warriors Theater Project with support from Mount Allison University and was awarded the Environmental Leadership Award. She performed in the inaugural Women's Art Festival and gave the keynote address on the Burning Times at the Women's Summit in Glen Margaret, Nova Scotia. In 2019, she was featured dancer at Snappy Fest Short and Sweet. Elizabeth's work evolves at the intersection of activism and art. She has long held passion for communicating with the animate world. So when offered a residency with the Joggins Fossil Institute, she jumped at the chance to engage with 300 million year old rock, writing Daring to Hope at the Cliff's Edge, Pangea's Dream Remembered, available through Chapel Street Editions. Elizabeth's dance experience spans from classical ballet to tap to modern, from choreographing to facilitating sacred circle dance. She reminds us that dance has been a central part of our communities for millennia, allowing us to embody and express that which cannot be spoken through words. Welcome, Elizabeth. Welcome to the summit. Thank you so much for having me, Leslie. I'm so thrilled to be part of this event. Thank you. You're welcome. And we're excited to hear what you have to say. You have a very long and varied <laughs> background. I do indeed. <laughs> so I think we have lots to talk about today. So let's just yes. jump right in. Yes. So maybe before we jump right in, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about your journey with dance. How did you start yes. with dance? What, what was the beginning for you? Uh, for me, the beginning, as you as you had shared in in the introduction, began when I was um, when I was a girl. I remember. So I'm dating myself here, but I grew up in the days of vinyl records, and in my family there was four vinyl records in our home. Um, one was Peter Paul and Mary. One was Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. Um, one was Babes in Toyland, and one was Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker. And I remember, even before going to school, that one of my favorite things to do, would I, I had this, my mother had this sort of piece of green fabric that I would uh, put safety pin and pretend that I was a butterfly or just a dance around. So dancing um, was a very important part of, of my childhood. Um, I, I started taking dance lessons when I was six with Miss Lillian. And Miss Lillian has only just recently passed from this world. Miss Lillian was one of the people who had my back during my years growing up. And I had come from a home um, where there was a fair bit of um, dysfunction, um, abuse, trauma. And I really believe that dancing, my Tuesday afternoon classes with Miss Lillian are, are one of the things that allowed me to, to pass through um, into my adulthood with all of that trauma in a way that, well, I guess allowed me a, a kind of a full life. So 
it's it's been hugely important to me yeah a lot of us can share that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think we a lot of us dance through traumas in our life not necessarily in childhood but it's definitely a way to to move yes. through those things and i think it is really healthy for children because it is a way yeah. for them to express themselves and and release and be creative and yes and yes. all of that so yes. yeah so we want to talk a little bit about our ancestral call to dance yes you, from burning times to today so why don't you tell us a little bit about that or or your thoughts about that okay well one of the things that i have observed in the course of my life so i'm i'm not you know i'm 62 i have observed that um as communities we dance much much less than we did even 50 years ago that there was much more of a prevalence for communities to get together and for everyone to dance i think one of the things that's happened in our culture that is concerning to me is that we have um given much of our creative birthright to dance, sing, tell stories to professionals. Now you might say, well, you're a professional artist, so isn't that a good thing? Well, it isn't. Because when only professionals do it, when everyday people don't have an embodied experience of doing these things, it becomes less and less relevant in their lives. Um, to the point where I see more and more that um, at community gatherings, when um, someone steps up and says, okay, let's, let's do a little circle dance. I sometimes I see the bodies of the little children go, oh, and then they get that sort of tacit message that, oh no, this is not okay. And I, I watch them go, oh, and then, oh, right. You know, my grandmother looks like somebody's asking her to step in doggy doo doo or something, or my, my sister or something. So that impulse that we have to join together in those ways, I find is getting more and more muted. And I believe that what makes dance so important right now is that we are at this critical juncture in our evolution as a species. And we have been dancing, I believe, since the beginning, since we first came here. I believe for as long as human beings have been on the planet, we have been telling stories through dance and doing ceremony through dance. Um, I think we have to reclaim that. I think it's very important for the reason that one of the problems that we're currently facing is the problem of how to come together as a collective to reimagine and recreate our future. And I believe that a lot of those answers lie in our DNA memories, right? So they're, for many of us, they're not in our memories from this life, but they are in our DNA memories and dance awakens that. So that's why I feel it is so, so very important. Yes, it's highly enjoyable, but there's something I think quite critical about it at this time in the world, that this moment in which we find ourselves. But don't you think part of that too is because we're sort of addicted to this idea of perfection that yeah. it, I, I shouldn't stand, if I'm not, if I didn't take dance classes, yes. then I don't dare get up and, and dance. Yes. Because yes. I find this like in my classes, that's why I call one of them dance as a spiritual practice because I want to get into this idea that Oh, this is a like moving meditation, you know, just even get away from the word dance because yes. people think dance, I'm not a dancer. Well, yeah. everybody's a dancer. Yes. Everybody can move. Everybody well, can not move. everybody, but hopefully, uh, you know, just the, the normal person can move and children, all children dance. So yes. this is, yeah. this yeah. is disturbing that, um, that, that we have this idea that if we weren't somehow taught something that therefore we can't do it. Yes, 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 yeah. And I do think and, it, it goes back to, again, what I was saying before this, this sort of putting it on, if you're not a professional, you can't do it. And I have seen communities come alive with 
sometimes I'm afraid to even call it dance for the very reason that you're saying, because people think I'm going to teach them a bunch of, you know, a, a whole series of steps and they're never going to be able to No, it's not that at all. So for me, my way in for dance with communities is simply exploring shapes and patterns and more and more I'm, I'm calling it creative movement or, or something else just because I find, as you say, that when I say to dance, people go, yes, I can't dance. <laughs> and yet our bodies need these things, right? Yes. Yeah. Thomas Edison said that all great ideas originate in the muscles. And most of us, as we grow older, we develop physical habits of how we carry ourselves in the world. And I love getting together with people and just doing very free form work to start to observe where they're habit how they're habitually holding their body. And then seeing the freedom that can come when I can just gently, once someone trusts me enough to say, oh, you know what, I, there's a sense of collapse in your chest here. Can we just, can we open that up? What does that feel like? And sometimes when that happens, there's a feeling of, of openness. Sometimes tears come because, you know, we've held something in here. Um, what I often observe in, in, in adults is an unwillingness to move their arms upwards, right? And there's a great, if you feel depressed, I promise you that if you do this, just stand with your arms uplifted for two or three minutes. Oh, you will feel so different. For women, often I see this you know, tendency to wanna not move our hips or not relax our belly, right? We still sometimes get stuck in this. We're supposed to look a certain way. So when I work with women and say, oh, let's, can we breathe into that beautiful round goddess belly of yours and, and, and move our hips in ways that are sensual? There's such freedom and such um, a, a deep kind of knowing that can emerge in those sessions that does not necessarily emerge by talking. It can't, right? Because it's in the muscles. It's in the muscles and it can only be freed from the muscles by breaking up those habits that we've carried all our lives of how we move. And the whole concept of creativity as well. I think yes. we need to move into the everyday creative. Again, that's become something that's a specialization that you can't draw unless you take art class. You can't cook yeah. unless you've taken cooking classes. And all of those things, like cooking is a really good example. Yes. So many people don't know how to cook anymore. Just yeah. basic food because we go and we buy it from whole foods or something and just those kind of everyday things i think that the the consciousness is shifting to this not being creative on a on a daily basis in some sort of way and that to me is frightening like i i think that whole creation thing is really part of the feminine and yes. those are the things that have been erased from our from our minds never mind about patriarchy but just the feminine even within women Yes. Those whole um, concepts of just creativity, that's gone. Yes. And, and I think that's frightening with children. I have grandchildren yes. now. So I'm seeing like how that they're not just allowed to be creative. They have to do it in a professional way. Or what did they learn at school? Did they learn yes. that at school? No, you yes. just pick up a yes. crayon and you draw something. And, and yes. that's being creative when it actually flows from you rather than, than having yes. it somehow coming the other direction where it's being fed into you. So yes. that to me is, is really frightening and that people don't know how to do that. I think our generation still did that, but younger people have no concept of, of like how to open that door. There's yes. too much... Um, technology maybe to to make you make a perfect drawing so that you're not ever going to sit down and try to draw something because you can create it on your computer yes. and i think there are people that just have no memory of what it was like to be create like like you're saying you used to take that piece of fabric 
and pin it on. Now they probably go on Amazon and buy a costume that's ready made or something, you know, yeah. and uh, which is nice, I'm sure. But but the things you could create on your own. And it was yeah. fun to do that. Yeah. So there's a lot in what you're saying. And I've, I have responses to quite a bit of what you just uh, were talking about right there. So first of all, um, we are always creating. Always. So the question is, what are we creating? Are we creating more deadness? Are we creating more apathy? Um, are we creating more separation? Are we creating more injustice? What are we, we are always creating. So what are we creating, right? So the idea of entering into a creative space consciously with a view to actively participating in what we are creating with our lives, right? So we're always creating. So when people say I'm not creative, it's like, sorry, that's BS. We're creating all the time. What is it you're creating? Um, but maybe that's about taking responsibility for it. Yeah. <laughs> you are creating, but are you taking responsibility for what you're creating? Yes, yes, yes. You also, it's really important point that you just brought up, um, the whole question of form and experience, right? Um, and in any creative practice, both of those things are important. But sometimes what I feel um, as a facilitator is it is when I work with adults, when I work with children and I want to take them into the world of dance, let's say, the first thing for me is to, uh, to take them, to take us into an experiential space where we can um, have an embodied experience of um, where we can have an embodied experience. Um, sorry, I'm getting excited, so I'm just going to slow myself down here. Because when I get excited, I talk too fast, and then no one will hear that. <laughs> you have a lot to say. It's okay. We have time. <laughs> um, so, so, okay, let me draw an analogy for you here. Um, uh, I'm a big sister. So one of the things I volunteer my time to do is, is to um, sort of mentor a, a young woman. And um, years ago, when I think she was in grade five at the time, and she was, um, we got together and I said, well, what are you doing in your class? And she said, oh, we're studying poetry. And I said, great, what poems are you studying? What poems did your teacher read to you? Oh, she didn't read us any poems. Oh, well, what, can you show me the poem you're writing? Oh, we're not writing poems. I said, so what are you doing in your study of poetry? Oh, well, we, she's taught us what is a haiku, what is a limerick. I thought, oh, that is madness. It's like when you teach the form before there is excitement about what can be learned through the form, the form becomes something deadening and then there is no interest in pursuing it. We see this with kids with math, right? Um, a gentleman that I worked with for years who's a... Um, uh, yeah. As he has a PhD, works out of Boise in Toronto. He said, the way we teach math to kids, he said, he calls it the black box of math. He said, instead of getting kids excited about patterns and how patterns repeat in the world and getting them into their bodies and moving patterns, because I teach, when I teach math to kids, I teach it with dance, with, you know, it's a great way to learn geometry with dance. Sure. Said, but instead, we teach them all this form. And because they're not excited about it, it feels dead. And then why do they want to use it? You see it with music. People teach their kids piano. And, you know, the, the teacher starts with the sharps and the flats and, you know, uh, it's, it, rather than finding out what moves this child musically, right? So... Once the experiential nature of it is set and there is an excitement, then to bring in form, um, that's the timing to bring in form. This is one of the things I learned as an improv artist. Form is important. And there is a certain kind of freedom in form. Mm -hmm. But what's crucial is when form is introduced. 
first there must be excitement. First, the body must be going, oh, I can't wait to go to my creative movement class. I can't wait to go to my music class. I can't wait to go and have some fun with Elizabeth. Once I see that light turn on in the person's eyes, and that's, for my, that's my job as a facilitator. I have to see the light in the eyes, the color in the face, the body language that says, okay, now I can begin to introduce form. Because if it's too soon, it becomes deadening. There you go. <laughs> yes, it has to have relevance, I think, yes. too. Like it needs yeah. to touch the person. I, I, th yes. I do think, I agree with you, experience is our greatest teacher. And I agree with you about form. There needs to be that balance between order and chaos. And we, uh, I, I, I never thought about the direction in which it comes in, but that's an interesting point that yes, mm -hmm that could create the spark. I guess I always imagined the person had the spark or they wouldn't be pursuing it, but that's not necessarily true. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've spent um, a great deal of my life, over 30 years, a part of my, part of my work has been going into schools and community settings and working with, with children and youth. So, you know, if, if I'm going into work with children to, sort of find ways to turn them onto math using dance. Um, let me tell you, often for, for some of these kids, when they, the teacher says, and now here's Elizabeth, and if she's gonna be doing some dance and I watch their little bodies, I'll go, dance, ew, <laughs> I'm not doing dance. So would you rather do math? <laughs> so my job is to, is to find ways to help them into that. And, and I employ any and all methodologies. Yeah. And they may have had negative experiences with dance, not just negative concepts, but- Well, again, but, most of them haven't had know. any experience. Yeah. Now, this is the thing I'm seeing with kids in school. And over the 30 years I've done this, it is becoming more and more prevalent that they haven't danced, um, they haven't sung. I go into kids, work with kids in grade two. It's like, what songs do you know? They don't know any songs. Nobody's really? sung to them. What wow. stories? So it's, we are giving, I mean, you, you made the point earlier, and this is important, Leslie, about, you know, they can go online and have a story read to them that has music in it, that everything is given to their brain. They don't have to work for it. So why should they want to read a book? Um, and yet all the studies are showing that this is not the, the, the sort of neuroplasticity that makes us alive human beings. There's certain things that are not developed when everything is given as it is when they watch a story or when they learn a song yeah. on the internet. It's, it's and really they're probably watching a dance video rather than getting up and putting the music on and dancing. Yeah. And I see for a lot of uh, young girls, particularly, they're trying to do when, when they want, when they do dance, they're trying to do the kind of dancing that they see on music videos, which, okay, that's fine, that's one way, but there's so many other ways. And some of those dances are so sexualized that I find it deeply upsetting to watch, you know, girls in grade four doing that. So I try and help them find ways into using and getting excited about <clears throat> dancing in ways that aren't just doing those sort of like hip bump things or aren't I sexy. And well, also, if they don't know anything else, then... Then that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. In the uh, Waldorf schools, they teach math through music. I yes. mean, I th and I, uh, my nephew went to a Waldorf school and I just find that fascinating. Yeah. Or make it relevant, like teach it through cooking. Oh, you know, yeah. the, the fractions, yeah. you could teach that through cooking or something just to make it relevant to, yeah. to the child. Yeah. I do a lot of work in schools with kids who are having um, learning challenges or who are on the spectrum. And I've had so many experiences with, you know, little kids who come to me and say, oh, miss, you know, I'm not very smart or miss, I can't do math or miss, I can't read or miss, I don't understand this. And then within the, you know, the, t the process of the time that we spend together over a period of many months or and sometimes I've had the gift of being able to spend many years with groups of kids to see them as they understand that, hey, 
yeah, I understand patterns because look at how well I was able to absorb the blocking in this play or the pattern in this choreography. That's math. Math is patterns. So when I can say to a kid, you know, there's no reason you can't excel in math because I want you to, I, I'm going to point out the, the excellence of your understanding and execution of these patterns. That's what math is. Yeah. But again, if they don't have the experience, then they don't know that. Like uh, if, if, you, if you just say, I'm going to teach you math and the child doesn't actually know what that is, it yeah. hasn't been defined. Is it's counting? No, it's not really. It's it's processes. Yeah. So, but if that's never been explained, and how do you explain these sort of abstract things to a child? So, if they can have that experience, then yes. then you know it. Like you said, it's it's in your body that that yes. we learn. So, yeah, that's really, where our wisdom is. Yeah, it's in our bodies. And what about community? You, you mentioned something about creating community through dance and heart-based community. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll start off with a little story, all right, just to, to sort of illustrate. So in 2009, when my, when my husband and I got married and we decided to invite, um, oh, there was over a hundred of our old friends to a reception. And we knew that what would happen if we just had a regular reception where there's a drink table and a snack table is that all the people that know each other from this context would stand together and all the people that understood each other because they all live in this community or whatever, because we have wandering feet. So we had friends who we've lived in multiple places. So a lot of these people didn't know each other. So what we did is that after everyone arrived, we did three circle dances with was probably about 120 people in this big hall and each of the circle dances had a slightly different focus one was um, very reverential in its honoring of the earth one was about celebrating community and one was just about getting a little bit funky so by the end of the three circle dances, what ended up happening was that in the reception, rather than having these little cliques, we had 120 people who were just so engaged with each other and not because people had drank a lot of wine. It was just beautiful. It's a way for, it's a way for us to get to know each other. We, we often think that the only way to get to know each other is through talking and talking is a nice way. But when our bodies engage in doing something together, we engage with a, a true heart-mind connection. And I've seen this kind of thing countless times. And I think then you have a shared experience as well. Yes, yes. They all danced together. They did the same thing. They actually do have something to talk about because they, they've, now they've done something together. Yes, yes. Dance does create community, and I think that community is something that, again, that one of those <laughs> concepts that that's sort of disappearing from the face of the earth. And again, maybe because people don't know what it is. A community isn't really just like a, an online Facebook group. I think it is about shared experiences, and, yes. and perhaps people just don't have things that take them or have experiences that, that allow them to know what community really is. Yeah, and I think, I think we have to get with the program pretty quickly and, and change that up because what I see more and more is that people feel they have, you know, and you and I are connecting, you're in Egypt and, and I'm here in Toronto, Canada, um, but we are engaging in, well, I'll call it the Silicon world, right? So, um, these, are not, the, these are not the kind of connections that are going to be helpful to us as we move forward. We need to have connections with people who are in our communities. And I'm not, I'm not saying our connection here, Leslie, isn't important. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that um, more and more, there are people are, are talking about the fact that 
we may be looking at a time of collapse coming up. So we need to, we need to have real embodied relationships with the people that live next door to us, that live in our community. So that if we turn on the tap and water doesn't come out, that we, we actually have relationships with, with these people that we can see. So that, yes, it's wonderful. I, I enjoy the communities of, of, of engagement that I have with people around the world through the internet and I'm grateful for it. But the kind of connections, we, we need to start looking at how do we create local solutions to the problems, to the things that we are going to face, that we are facing as runaway climate change continues, also known as massive systems failure. So this is why this kind of practice is important. Um, one of the things I know we, we talked about is, you know, how to fully embody joy. And to fully embody joy means getting into our bodies. And getting into our bodies means also getting in touch with what for many of us, you know, people are now calling it eco-anxiety or, you know, climate anxiety. It means getting into our felt experience of, of the sorrow that there is no longer that species or that that island is, is no longer present. So it means getting out of our, um, our culture's business as usual mode with its focus on efficiency, speed and radical self-interest and more into how do we create local, how do we create local connections? Does and one way to reduce anxiety is to practically do something. So I think that if, if we're having this eco anxiety, well, how can we do that? And if we can do that with the people around us, then I think you've moved into action Yes. And not, again, that it's in your head. I think that anxiety is usually coming from that place of being all in your head. Well, if you actually went out and physically did something about it, even if it's not the whole answer, then it can, it, that can relieve the anxiety. And, and as you said, connecting with the people around you and doing yes. that, something like that with a community around yes. you. Yes, because that anxiety really these are nature's wisdom chemicals, right? These phytochemicals are um, our nature. This is what, you know, evolution has given us. And the purpose of these chemicals is to go, hey, there's some danger here, pay attention. So it's calling us to action. So to honor the evolutionary purpose of those chemicals is to then say, okay, what can I do? do what can we do i really think we have to find our way back more into we you know the part of the illness of capitalist culture has been the individualist focus so to find our way back into the circle of we um so what what do we what what is the new narrative that we are going to create the other benefit of dance as relates to these phytochemicals is that if left unexpressed these phytochemicals, the cortisol, uh, the adrenaline, they pool in our muscles. They create muscle tension and, and over the long term, if they're not released, they create illness. So the only way to release this pooling in the muscles that happens is to physically move because that's the only way the lymphatic system can free the body from, from those chemicals. So another very practical reason why um, dance, creative movement is so important to us right now. I remember reading an article uh, some years ago, it was from some medical journal that said that they now realize that the, uh, the species that survived were, were um, genetically predisposed to dance. And that's yeah. why they survived. And I think that that's true because dance makes you dynamic. You know, there's always that action and reaction kind of thing, first of all. Yeah. And there's that sense of community. If you're, if you're dancing to music, you're following a guide. If you're dancing with other people, you have that sense of response yes. to the other people. And I think that, and, and again, it's embodied. So, so you're physically moving through a space, doing that kind of the dance of, that's, that's my, my whole idea of the universal dancer is that dance of co-creation. 
But um, I, th I found it interesting that they actually had scientific proof that that was one of the things that made these species survive was that they had these genes that made them predisposed to dance. So I think I want, that's a good I enough reason. That, I want a copy of that study. Like, okay. <laughs> yep, no, I have it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And that's uh, unfortunate going back to kind of where we started with, with the whole idea of creativity or having to be an expert in some field. I think really science sort of undermined that a little bit when we, excuse me, went into that idea that um, it had to be scientific or it had to be proven and science kind of took over and creates it, creativity took a back seat. And now I think scientists are coming around full circle to say, hang on, well, what were these things that actually made people survive like that one are actually coming from a place of creativity. So I think we, I guess the pendulum needs to swing all the way in order to, yes. to swing yeah. back. But our belief that of this very um, ordered scientific um, again, hierarchical, you know, you have to have proof and you have to, you have to know, or you have to have studied really took us out of just being human beings and, and allowing our creativity to come through. We, I don't have to prove that to you. I just have to express myself and let it, and let it come through. Yeah. And, and one, you know, I, I would, um, when, for instance, when you look back um, into the early, uh, into the medieval days, at when the first universities started to um, be created, in those early years of university, there, there, there still was a respect for the mystical, right? So whether we call it the, 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 great, the creativity or, 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 or mysticism, there was a respect that the conversations about the science that was emerging still stood in a context of um, respect for the mystery, right? But then when we got into the Industrial Revolution or the Scientific Revolution, it, it, it became um, nature as something dead, nature as commodity, nature as for us to use. And of course, all these wonderful experimentations happened with ways to control societies that were based in, they practiced them on the poor, and then they practiced them on women, they practiced them on uh, people that were considered other, and then they took those great teachings out into the world as colonialism, and, with, and we know all the, the horrible things that happened with that. But what we're seeing now is that Many scientists, and here I'm thinking of Diana Beresford Kroger, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, um, uh, what is his name, Stephen Harding, who teaches at Schumacher. There is a resurgence for many scientists of coming back to respect for the mystery. Stephen Harding, for instance, as a biologist said, I realized that the words that I was taught to use to describe what I see when I go out and observe processes in the forests, they don't begin to touch the feelings in my heart that I experience when I observe these things, when I sit in relationship with them. So these scientists are starting to acknowledge the relationship, the animacy of the earth. And I'm really pleased to see that come back. Yes, and I think things do have to go full circle. Yes. When, when we lose something is when we begin to value it or see its absence. Like he said, he, yes. he needs those experiences to really create a full, a full description of it. So, yeah. 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 Wow. yeah. I want to go back to something that you said about embodiment of joy, but what about using dance and, and nature imagery. You were saying something about using nature imagery to break these physical patterns that, that keep us stuck. How do you do that? Yes, yes. So sometimes it can be just as simple as sometimes I'll take a group of children out, you know, into the marsh and we'll just sit for a few minutes in quiet and observe, for instance, the flight of the dragonflies over the tall grasses. 
and then I'll, I'll get them up and we'll stand in a circle and you know you you have a choice just okay let's be let's all be the tall grasses and oh there's a big wind coming up what are the, how do the tall grasses move differently you know, so you so you you engage them in that idea of um you know what are the tall grasses like when it's pouring rain you know when there's a when there's a hurricane when it's a beautiful sunny day um the movement of the dragonfly um and i do this with it with adults as well sometimes we use animals and i'll ask them you know i want you to go home and i want you to for, for our next time together i want you to come back with an idea um of what is your favorite animal and what is the animal that most repulses you and then we play with how would those animals move you know um and 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 involving all our you know our, our joints and our bodies in in engaging in how that animal moves and how do they move in in different seasons how do they move in different situations um how do they move you know and and these can be anything four-footed eight-legged winged with gills whatever um, but again it, it the indigenous people remind us that we are little brother and sister in creation right and that these animals are our teachers and this is the wisdom of, of going back and 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 reading and understanding indigenous ways of knowing that these creatures have been here much longer than us and they are our teachers in robin wall kimmerer's beautiful book braiding sweetgrass she talks about some of her elders you know saying to her oh i hear you have a you need to go spend some time with the standing people so you need to go out and be in the forest and 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 listen and learn and speak to them um, you need to go and have a talk with the river mother so all of these kind of things they take us into a remembered relationship with the animate world our bodies i believe understand our relationship but we have been taught to see ourselves as separate oh that's just a tree oh that's you know that's just a rock uh-uh these are our teachers these creatures have been here longer than us so when we um go into a respectful place of okay i'm going to the dragonfly right now is is my favorite go-to so i'm going to dance the dragonfly so part of that means I go sit in the marsh and I look at the abundance of dragonflies and just praise them and thank them and then say I'm just going to try to, to dance with you dragonfly and you know people might look at you as if you're strange but frankly I don't care anymore <laughs> <laughs> sometimes to be separate from the crowd is a good thing <laughs> And what kind of responses do you get? I mean, I'm curious, do the, do the children like feed back to you? Because I agree and I feel like the, uh, people, are, people and children are so disconnected from nature. I'm yeah. wondering what their response is to this. Again, uh, th this is where as a facilitator, I look for the cues that tell me that they're ready for this. The younger the children are, usually the more quickly I can go into this. I can go into a kindergarten class and do this on day one, and they'll be thrilled. Um, if I'm working with you know, kids in grade eight, it's going to take me a while. They're going to have to trust me. And so we're, I'm gonna we're going to do uh, many, many other activities before we get to that. Because for kids in grade eight, that just, just sounds far too woohoo. So once I have their trust, then, then, then they'll engage. But that's my job as a facilitator is to know how to lay the groundwork for them to find a way in it that doesn't leave half of them standing in the back of the room going, oh, this is just so weird. Why do I have to do this? I don't like it. <laughs> and with some kids and with adults, more and more, oh my goodness, takes, takes a while, takes a while. I've, I've seen more and more adults in their bodies who really, when I, I can't just say move freely as maybe I could 20 years ago. What does that mean, move freely? Okay, I'm just going to put on some movement and just move as you feel, but I don't know how. Yeah. What do I do? What does that mean? Yes. And it's so, and I, and I see they feel like there, there's a way, like there's, there's a right way. It's like there isn't. Close your eyes, listen to the music, 
what does that feel like? What do you want to do? And they're, they're freaking terrified. <laughs> so how to get them to a place of, of feeling like, oh yeah, when I listen to that, well, what does your shoulder want to do? Sometimes it's like, even as I'm going to break it down, it's too much for them to dance with their whole body. Okay, what would your fingers like to do to that? <laughs> What, your, what, was, what would this joint like to do? So to just like break it down and break it down and break it down in a way that, that allows them that feeling of exploration. Because I want people to come back. I don't want them to feel like, I didn't, she said free dance. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. So it's my job to find that way to lay the groundwork. I'm just curious about them feeding back to you if they actually knew any of these animals or whether this is a whole new are you opening a completely new door for these people or children that that they don't i i feel like people don't even know the names of animals anymore and i'm curious as to whether these people you're working with do or whether this is kind of a mysterious world that they've never explored before for many of them it's quite mysterious yeah if, if when I step in with a new group, I see that there's, um, you know, hesitancy around this, I'll, I'll often just start more with things that I know that they know. So maybe we'll do an exercise where I have an exercise I do called walk as if. So we do just, we just walk around the room and then there's points of pause and then, okay, now we're going to walk as if we're walking through peanut butter. Um, now we're going to walk as if, oh, you've got poison ivy. How are you going to walk? <laughs> um, oh, your hair's on fire. How are you going to walk? Walk as if. So just to start to stimulate the, the imaginations that we all have to begin to feel somewhat comfortable to create something that hasn't been um, spoon fed to you. Um, with animals, often I'll say a bird because a lot of people don't know, you know, a, 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 a peregrine falcon flies in a way that's very different than a hummingbird. But for many people, they don't know that because many of us are very disconnected from yeah. these worlds. And many children that I work with now have, have, many of them have never been out in a forest. They have not had that lived experience, very painful. So how do I get them? How can I start with something that they know? Maybe it's the flowers in their grandmother's garden. Maybe it's the tree outside the school. Sad, but true. I, yeah. 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 So what are you doing mainly these days? Like what you, you, you said you're working with children and I mean, do, are you doing workshops and things or what? Tell us a little bit about anything that's on the horizon for you. Well, one of the things I've, um, that has really, I, I think in some ways, saved my life over the last couple of years is the work of uh, Joanna Macy. Joanna Macy is an eco-Buddhist philosopher, and her work is called The Work That Reconnects. So I'm um, a Work That Reconnects facilitator, and my way into the work is using artistic modalities. Um, so I've Last year, I created a workshop, and, and in, the, in the upcoming year, I intend to launch a series of workshops that are based on the work that reconnects, where we honor the spiral of life. And the spiral, as Macy calls it, is gratitude, honoring our pain, right? That we have to honor our pain for what's happening in the world right now. Um, and then moving into a place of seeing with new eyes, and then going forth to create the new collective. So I'm, I'm doing that. Um, I haven't been doing um, any work in the schools recently because the last two years have really been about me um, finishing this book and, and launching it, which I just did recently. Um, when I took the artist residency at the Joggins Fossil Cliffs, I was what I had committed to was creating a um, a suite of 12 poems. Well, it was way more than that, right? As an artist, there was, I always talk about, it's about listening. So I wanted to go to these 300 million year old cliffs with the idea of like, what do we do? And what is my role in this? So what was supposed to be a suite of 12 poems ended up being a 60 plus page narrative eco poem that was two years of my life. So that's, 
that's what I've been doing mostly for the past, uh, certainly for the past year. Yeah. Well, and that's time consuming. And I have to say, I haven't, I haven't read your whole book, but I've read parts of it. And I, I feel, I feel the dragonfly. I feel like all of these, um, <laughs> all of these things coming through. And let's just kind of step into that because that's actually what you have. I, I want you to talk a little, well, you did mention your book, but, but I think that's what your free gift is as well. So um, yes, why don't you speak yeah. a little bit about that it's um so the free gift is an excerpt from the book um daring to hope at the cliff's edge and um, published by chapel street editions so i have always um felt a deep connection with the animate world that began in childhood high up in the arms of an old weeping willow who knew my heart best of anyone so when I was offered this uh, residency, I jumped at the chance to communicate with 300 million year old rock with a view to asking, what do we do here? And what followed was a year long odyssey that took me deep into the heart of my own eco despair and forced me to practice and practice is important, right? forced me to practice what Joanna Macy calls um, active hope, using a tool that I learned from um, a Mi'kmaq elder, Albert Marshall, from the work of Albert Marshall, which is called two-eyed seeing. And two-eyed seeing is seeing the world. One eye sees the world through the best of Western knowledge and ways of knowing. And through the other eye, we see through the best of indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing. And then the, the level of mastery, and I don't pretend to have reached that yet, but to be able to look through both eyes at the same time for the benefit of all creation. So this book is the result of that. And I see this book um, as a, um, a conversation starter in a way to begin uh, to, to support us to create the kind of difficult but necessary conversations that we have to have as we face um, stand at this juncture in our history and i think it's really important for me to to put out how this is you know connected to the whole idea of dance when you look back in history um dancing music and poetry for most of our uh, most of our history on this planet have been inseparable Right? We've separated them off into disciplines. But when you think about the old bards that traveled around, dancing, poetry, music, were all part of the same storytelling, um, lamenting, honoring. These things were not separate. So th this is very much, uh, this very much relates to the little girl who put pieces of satin on her arm and danced around in the living room. <laughs> it comes from the same core place of expression for me. It's your, your offering in words. It is. It's, and, yeah. and, and there is one of the comments I got in the advanced reviews was how beautiful it is to see the way Elizabeth's words dance across the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're very, it's very dynamic. I'm not, I'm not well versed in poetry, so uh, but but this I found very easy to read, and I did I got that same very dynamic feeling from from reading it as if there's a lot of movement in it somehow. Yes, yes, and and poetry has suffered in the same way that most of the arts have in the way that it's taught. It's been taught in a way that's very rarefied, very, you know, a little bit snooty. What's the right answer? What did the poet mean? As opposed to, yes. <laughs> what do you get from it? <laughs> How do you feel when you read this? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, poetry, in essence, is kind it's Poetry is, is a very distilled art form. So if you think of it almost like homeopathy, so where prose, you know, might go on for many pages, the poet is challenged to take a big idea and distill it down with almost the minimum number of words necessary 
that engage, will engage the reader on a sensory level. What they see, what they hear, what they feel, what they smell, you know, touch, all of those kind of things. And I have, I feel honored. I've had many people who've come to me and said, you know, I never got poetry before, but I, I actually enjoyed reading. It just, thank you. So that to me yes. is one of the greatest things. Because poetry is, poetry is wonderful. And it should never have been it rarefied in the way that it has been in our culture. And I, what that has also meant is merit very hard for poets to make a living. I got to tell you. Yes. <laughs> but again, it's one of those things. Like, like if someone would come in and say, I'm not a dancer. Yes. You know, yes. I would come in and say, I'm not a poet. I mean, I, that was my belief was like, I'm not a poet. I don't, I, I can, I'm a writer. I'm not a poet. I don't understand poetry. And then when we had the revolution here in Egypt in 2011, yes. all of the sudden it was like something opened and I would wake up in the morning and while I'm making coffee, these poems would just download and I would run, it was almost like I was throwing up, you know, they would just like, blah, just yes. come out. Yes. so I wrote them all down. And I think there's like five of them. And then that's it. That, that was my career as a poet. Yes, yes. <laughs> it ended there. <laughs> but I found that fascinating. Like that, that is just something I do not understand. Like I said, I, I'm not a poet. I don't understand it. But then there it was. You know, it just it just came through. So that made me that really changed my uh, not that I go out and read poetry, but it it that that opened a door for me to curiosity. Like that's really interesting. Why did that ha What what's that all about? Why did this come through as poems? And I think that one reason is what you just said because it was very yes. visceral. Yeah. Yes. It was very emotional. Yes, I could sit and write a book. And I did. I wrote blog posts about the revolution. But they, this was something different. And even, the, even it wasn't necessarily related to the revolution. It was just yes. these things that came through. And somehow there was just that yes. opening. So Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it just, it, it, it brings to mind for me to just say that like I'm sitting here looking at you with the, your, the beautiful pictures, the beautiful stones that you have behind you there. And I think one of the, the, the failings of Western culture is that we have not been sufficiently interested enough in other cultures. And I'm just not talking about ancient Egypt, current Egypt, you know, what's happening in the Middle East. Um, a way to dance is an amazing way to get into culture. You can um, come away with an embodied sense of a culture by just having the courage to go to, um, oh, I see that there's a Ukrainian dance group and they're offering, you know, it's free, I can go on Thursday night. I can learn more about Ukrainian culture by going and dancing with them and doing some of their traditional movements. I can learn more about Indian culture. And I'm not saying that, you know, that, that was not my strength. My strength was ballet, modern, tap, jazz. And then um, in my 40s, I got into flamenco. But so many forms, just to go and experiment with it. And it will take you into an experiential understanding of the culture that you'll never get by, by just looking at pictures or, or even talking to people. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. profound. And I want for us, my joy in doing this today is I really want to encourage us all to, to reclaim this thing because it, it brings us joy and connection with each other and we need these things right now well thank you elizabeth thank you for speaking to us today and and thank you to the listeners for for joining us and please download the pdf of elizabeth's part of elizabeth's book so you can get an idea of what that's all about and thank you yeah it's been lovely to speak to you yes thank you <laughs> thank you Mwah. hasta la vista bye-bye <laughs> bye-bye